And it is always my pleasure to share with Reverend Sona. She has energy and more energy and lots of good sense. So please listen. <laughs> Good morning, good morning everyone, and uh, welcome, welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. And you know, we always extend our welcome to those on the, help me, World Wide Web. And it's more than a pleasure, it's a joy to share with Reverend Anne, who I share so many things in this church with this morning. I feel blessed. Well, well, well. What a wonderful world, a wonderful world. Now I find the peace and the joy within. What a wonderful world, a wonderful world, a wonderful, wonderful world. You recognize those words, don't you? <laughs> In our church service, we have often sung this song. And it touches me deeply, as I am sure it touches you also. I feel so much joy as I join the other voices in loudly proclaiming the fact of this wonderful world. The words of this song is at the back of my mind many mornings as I open my eyes in silent, from the silent miracle of sleep. It is within me also as I start my daily prayer in the workplace each day. It prompts me as I look around and I say to myself, this is my introduction, may I preamble to my prayer. I give thanks for this privilege of life. I give thanks that I have been chosen so carefully to express life in this world on this planet, in this country, in this space, at this time, knowing all that I do know at this time. I rattle it off every morning. But I just wanted to make sure I remembered it as I said it, so I wrote it. You see, no matter, after you have acknowledged and given yourself the time to be grateful for your life, which you never take for granted. No matter what happens throughout the day, I can truly say that this gratitude doesn't waver. But there is, yes, there is a but. I have to discipline myself and intentionally discipline myself to remain committed to the truth no matter what the experience, the appearance of randomness in the things that come into my life. The appearance may be of global conflict, the apparent disorder on the streets, I say apparent, images of human suffering and cruelty, domineering leaders, passive, and compliant followers. No matter what we see, there is beneath all this a reality which is undisturbed intelligence, which is order, divine order. My topic this morning, what a wonderful world. My theme is a universe of law and order. I must confess that when prompted by spirit to consider order as my topic, I had already made up my mind what I, the little I, the little ego, had wanted to speak about. I took it personally and kept putting that topic aside. However, the topic kept coming at me morning after morning, no matter how many other topics I came up with. So I had a serious, serious talk with spirits, like the big becker character, Jacob, who wrestled with God until he got the answer he desired. 
I said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I grappled and wrestled with trying to find an escape route from this topic until I got the reply. You let go so that I can hold on. Argument done. So here I am, letting go and letting God, having loved everything I have learned. Because whenever a topic is given to us, it's about us. Order begins in mind. It is first cause in the mind of God and cause to all of the individual good we may experience. The Universe is Spiritual Law and Order is the title of a booklet called the title of one chapter in a booklet from the seminar lectures by Dr. Ernest Holmes. If this is so apparent that the universe is spiritual law and order, then why is it that there is such apparent chaos? The chaos is in the eyes of the beholder. The universe is order. It is orderly on the cosmic scale. Night follows day, and day follows night on the planet. Chicken eggs give rise to chicken. Babies become adult humans. Mango seeds give rise to mango trees, which give rise to mangoes. Planets remain in their orbits. Yet, to the astronomer's gaze, stars are exploding. Some are being sucked into black holes. Asteroids are bumping into celestial bodies and scenes of apparent grand chaos is taking place. But for every one of these activities, there is that which creates out of the experience, that which creates all that we know as the universe. Even the planet Earth was caused by a grand collision, which ended up by a little piece gone to the moon, and the rest saying here, did you know that, right? Even Jamaica came out of a volcano under the sea 70 million years ago. And that's why everything is so green and beautiful. Everything that happens has a purpose. Every single thing that has a purpose. And most of us know by now that every atom in our bodies came from the explosion of a star. You all know that, right? There, it, the force of the explosion created the iron, which makes your blood red, right? And so many other things. This universe, which seems to the unlettered eye as chaotic, is doing its own thing. And beneath all the business and the activity, beneath all of that, is stillness, absolute stillness. If you contemplate what they call a black hole, which we used to think was emptiness, it is now super packed, so packed that nothing can escape from it to our eyes. Our eyes can't see it. But we know that all the darkness between all the particles that we see, there is an intelligence that is at work. The scientists now know that it is not nothingness. It is plentiness. Plentiness. So while we are looking at the cosmos, hurricanes come and go, icebergs melt, temperatures are soaring, fires are burning, valuable acres of land, and even houses. Nonetheless, there is order and harmony that escapes the casual gaze. The universe is one of law and order. We accept this, but we can also prove it in our personal lives. But first, we come to understand our relationship to that law and order, how to make it work for us by deliberate action. The ancient philosophers and mystics have intuitively explained to humanity what is now being researched in science. I will share 
this research, some of it later. But first, let us look at our Declaration of Principles of the Science of Mind. We need to refer to it repeatedly because it reminds us what we believe. And I quote one paragraph, we believe in God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. So with all that we see that seems as if it is going to be, it is being destroyed, it is one. It is one, cannot be destroyed. It is having fun. It is having fun through its creation. Absolute, it cannot be changed. It was, has always been, will always be, it was never made or created. It's self-existent. That means it doesn't have anything but itself. Anything that we see and know has come out of that one. And we go on, this manifests itself in and through all creation. But guess what? It is not absorbed by creation. So whatever we see beneath it is that which has never been born, has never been made manifest except through its creation. The creation, just points of expression, just crests of waves within an infinite body of unmanifest, unbounded intelligence. This is a description of definite, clearly defined logical facts. The declaration also says, we believe in the unity of all life and that the highest God and the innermost God is one God. So that God which we see that does all these wonderful things in the planets, with the planets and in the universe, is the same God that exists in, through, and as each one of us. And we believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. So the way God is there regardless, but we experience and benefit from that by our own realization that the indwelling presence lives in and through and as us. So the universe is spiritual law and order. You can prove it, and if you can prove it, it is a law. And if it is a law, you can prove it. What a wonderful, generous world. So what is this law? We know it by many names, but it is the law of cause and effect. This teaching is pretty simple. Simple no matter how many big books are written, it all boils down to cause and effect. We think, and that becomes the cause to our experience. The experience is the effect. The effect cannot stand on its own. It can only bear itself as long as the cause, which is our thoughts, remain there in place. So cause is the unseen corresponding idea within. So sometimes it's helpful to trace back so some we may not know what the cause is because a lot of our thoughts are just rattling by like you know wild horses and we have not stopped to consider them or catch them. But if we are repeatedly having an experience, we can know that that experience is an effect which can be nullified, changed by reversing the thought which caused it. And if we are not sure what the thought is, we know at least what we want to experience. So if we're always losing things, then what do we do? We don't have to keep digging to find out a thought that caused that. If you can, good for you. But I believe I always say this teaching is the highest form 
We don't have to go through years of, of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. You go straight to the cause. What do you want? If you want, if you don't want to keep losing things, you don't sit and ponder, I don't want to. You want to declare that all things that I have are mine and I choose to keep them, right? Until I am ready to let them go, right? So we don't ponder what is not, what we don't want. So we believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, so that universal spirit, which is there, keeping everything in its rightful place, which is creating on the big scale, is also creating through us on the small, on the personal scale. And we can prove it. We prove it when we know that this is what happens. So guess what we do? By our treatments, our affirmations, and our attention, then we will then know because we will see First time we may say, oh, you know, you're, you're going for uh, the, you know, the proverbial um, car park. So you might just say, oh, it's a buck up, right? But if you repeatedly, and there are other things you can demonstrate, but anything that you want to demonstrate, if you repeatedly create the pattern, the thought, the belief, the attention in your own mind, and each time you see that it happens just that way, then that is a law of personal experience. But we can tell you that if you repeatedly act like this, it becomes just a part of our DNA almost, established in us. Now, there is a wonderful book that <laughs> by Greg, Br Br yes, very Braden. Many of you would have read it. I was lent this by, this is a confession by Glenn Manley, many, many years ago. And it was on my bookshelf where I have many books, so many books. Need a little order, some of them, but many, many books. And this book looked at me and beckoned to me this time. And I read it for the first time, even though I am familiar with the author and I've seen snippets from it elsewhere. And I read it. Yes, Glyn, I have it. You can come and get it now. <laughs> so there are three important experiments he described in this quite big book, right? Not too big for us to borrow and read, right? It is called The Divine Matrix. The first experiment that he described, he did none of them. He was aware of them. One that was done in the early 1990s, where they actually were able to extract DNA and cause the DNA to influence light particles. You know, DNA is the packet of information which we each person has in their bodies, which determines your peculiar characteristics and also which you pass on to the next generation, at least some of it. So they actually were able, now this is information that is not widely expounded in the medical community at all, right? But it, research was done by credible um, researchers. In fact, two of them were done by the US military. So he found that by the, the DNA, the information that controls what is in it was able to affect the light particles significantly, so much so that it could be documented. Then the second experiment, he goes into great detail. I'm just introducing it to you. He said, he wanted to demonstrate the effect of emotions on living cells, specifically DNA. No, the other experiments had shown that living cells could be and were affected by emotions when it was in the body of the person who was having the emotion. 
But they went on now to take the DNA and the cells from somebody's body and place it in a specific glass container. And then they had the emotions. They got people to get about five which he trained carefully. I think they could have found others, but at that time they were not aware that they were meditators. They got them to practice becoming very, very still, very calm. And in that one particular case, they looked, they asked them to focus on their heart when they had become extremely still. And then they actually focused on the container that had the DNA. And they noticed a reaction, a positive reaction, an obvious reaction, both in the form and later on when they did the chemistry of it. It had actually changed. No. What they did, they weren't satisfied with that. The army stopped the research at that point, but a particular researcher who was a part of that experiment wanted to take it further. The first, the second experiment, the one I just described, the, the container was moved to another room, just next door. With this one, the person took it several, at first, several, meters away, and then eventually took it miles away, and found out that they repeated the same experiment and found a reaction. And not only did they see a reaction, even though it was distance apart, but the reaction was taking place in real time, at the same time as the emotions were being focused on. And out of that, guess what? They came up with a conclusion, which the people already knew intuitively, masters knew thousands of years ago, that there is an energy connecting everything. Hmm. That DNA in our bodies, well, this might be a little expressed a little differently, gives us access to the energy that connects us to our universe. And emotions, actually, affect the DNA, which then connects us to the universe and allows us to not only have the experience from the universe, but actually we have an effect on the universe as well. And it says, and he Baden encourages us, she says, our thoughts and positive feelings and prayers within us can be effective in the world around us. So we don't have to look around and think, oh, chaos, 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 right? Look and see beneath all the chaos, the order, the beauty of the wonderful, wonderful world in which we live in. And he says, we are creators, and we know that. And even more, we are connected to create, creation through the divine matrix, which is what he called the space that occupied between the object that he had uh, put at a distance and that they were working on. He said that we are in constant, right? And we have been told before I read it carefully, I hope you remember that we are surrounded by immersed in this one. So we can hasten our own spiritual advancement by cultivating optimistic, positive attitude. So affecting our inner environment and our outer environment, which in turn feeds back to us. We can practice silence and stillness to enhance the power of mind and then in turn, enhance our control over our personal circumstances. We have heard in stillness. Now, we seek and find the wisdom of the greater mind. Be still and know that I am. So, friends, live intentionally 
Align your thoughts with the good you desire. Desire good for yourself and all humanity and resolve to expect it. That's the advice of Swami Paramansa Yogananda, a two. Pa Swami Paramansa Yogananda from his teacher. And he says, if the object, this is Paramansa now, Yogananda, who wrote autobiography of a yogi. If the object of one's desire is clearly defined, the desire, even if the desire does not yet exist, the universe will produce it for the person who desires it. So don't be afraid or hesitant to desire anything which does not exist as yet. Because the universe knows how to make it happen. In fact, we are created just for that purpose, to be able to be that through which creation takes place at the individual level, even as it takes place at the macro level. And there is a little, there's a little kind of affirmation which Paramahansa Yogananda, I got it right now, has given, which I like. He says, the laws of life can teach us to live in harmony with nature and all aspects of life. When we know what the laws are and conduct ourselves in accord with them, we experience happiness, health, and perfect harmony. That was the advice. And the affirmation from Roy Eugene Davis, I am thankful for the understanding I now have. I am wholeheartedly dedicated to live a God-centered life. I do my best to have my life enhancing desires fulfilled in cooperation with the natural law of causation, the law of cause and effect for us. I am receptive to the impulses of grace and thankfully accept the full support of the universe. And I'm going to ask you to read a couple of lines with me as I say it. I am thankful for the understanding I now have. I am thankful for the understanding now I now have. I am wholeheartedly dedicated to live a God-centered life. I am wholeheartedly dedicated to live a God-centered life. I do my best to have my life enhancing desires fulfilled. I do my best to have my life enhancing desires fulfilled. And I do it in cooperation with the natural law of causation. I do it in cooperation with the natural law of causation. I am receptive to the impulses of grace. I am receptive to the impulses of grace and thankfully accept the full support of the universe. And thankfully accept the full support of the universe. So friends, be grateful that you have been created so uniquely to live in this universe, on this planet, in this place, at this time, knowing all that you know now. Bless it. Give thanks for it and allow it to thrive as you plant that in the law of mind and the law of causation takes it and watch as your spiritual growth skyrockets. Namaste.